Good morning. Good morning. Hey, so glad you're all here this morning. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to uh, Blessings Christian Church. It's wonderful to gather together this morning on the first day of the week on Sunday to turn our hearts and minds towards the uh, living God. Uh, my name is Pastor Greg, and I'll be uh, sort of hosting the service today. Uh, also, just wanted to welcome Pastor Ian from Mercy. Where is Pastor Ian? Here, who will be sharing God's word and preaching. Don't be alarmed or offended in any way if Pastor Ian rushes out after the sermon or shortly after he's preaching in Niagara Falls right after this service. So, uh, so glad you could be here, Ian, and looking forward to um, the word that, that, that you'll, you'll share uh, with us all. Uh, just as we start, I wanted to read us a short verse. Why are we here? What are we doing? Romans 5, chapter 8 from the Bible says these words, but God demonstrates... Uh, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're here because we are called to be here by uh, the true and living God, the God who has made heaven and earth, made all things, made us, and the God who loves the world and loves us. And so uh, we're called by him to worship this morning. Uh, how does God demonstrate his love for us? It says, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. This is the human problem, the human condition that all of us will face death, that all of us struggle with sin and brokenness, that all of us in a way uh, have, a, have a sense inside us that we, we want to be better people, we want to we do more, we want to we be more loving, more kind, and we are held as people by the power of sin until we turn to Jesus Christ and acknowledge him and surrender our lives to him and accept the work that he has done for us on the cross and receive his power and know his affirmation. So welcome, just one and all, uh, whether this is your first or second time to Blessings, whether you're viewing online, so glad that you can be here this morning. You may have questions about the church or about Christianity in general. Uh, there's ushers in blue shirts. You can speak to them, speak to myself, speak to Pastor... Well, you can't speak to Pastor Ian, but you can email Pastor Ian after... Um, and there's also a welcome card here. Please do fill one of those out if you're interested in being contacted or having a conversation about blessings or Christianity. Fill it out. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. You can also email info at blessingshamilton.ca. Uh, one of the ministries, one of the opportunities on Sunday mornings here at Blessings is prayer. Uh, prayer for yourself, prayer for a need in the world, and so immediately following the service, if you wish to pray with someone, uh, there'll be members of the prayer team here by the prayer banner following the service, and please just do come forward and uh, share with them and spend a moment uh, in prayer. You can also email prayer requests or prayer concerns to prayer-team at blessingshamilton.ca. I invite you as you're able to rise for our call to worship. Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sounds of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises.
It is so good to uh, sing together about uh, the promise and hope of heaven. And as we come to worship, we come to the courts of the Lord our God. Uh, we are called by Him and we expect to be met by Him. And so let us lift up our hearts. There'll be an opportunity today, uh, you'll see the Lord's Supper is being prepared before us, and there'll be an opportunity today uh, for the Lord's Supper. And as we consider that, uh, I'd like to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Uh, in terms of how we are uh, meant to approach uh, the Lord's table, the bread, of course, his body broken for us, um, and, and the blood, the, the wine, his blood shed for us, poured out for us. In 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks to the church there about the best way to come uh, uh, to the Lord's Supper. He says in chapter 11, verse 20, starting in verse 26, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if you are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not finally be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. You see, the thing that we need to realize in this passage is that the church in Corinth, some of the churchgoers in Corinth um, had uh, forgotten, had become mistaken on what it meant to, um, to partake of the bread and the wine, Christ's body and blood. They didn't realize what the Lord's Supper was about. And so Paul is giving them a, a very kind of heavy word here about the need to examine themselves first. How? Well, to examine themselves, it says in verse 29, uh, around how they discern the body of Christ. And I think one of the big elements here is that the church in Corinth and us as well in our own lives can get so absorbed in the self, right, in, in, in the me, in the my needs. And the church in Corinth, they were, uh, some people were eating really good food, others had no food, some were, uh, some were eating without others, uh, there was a sense that there was a higher class of people or Christian and a lower class over here. And so the church in Corinth didn't understand what it meant to be the family of God, to be children adopted into God's family, each of us, have been, uh, Christ has died for each of us the same. None of us have a rank above the other. We all, no matter where we are in our lives, bow down before Jesus Christ, his authority and his love. And so as we just come to pray for a moment, uh, I invite us just to consider how we uh, see and regard ourselves uh, versus how we regard others and honor others around us. Let us bow down. Let us pray. Gracious God, how we thank you for the good news in Jesus Christ and for the joy of Christian faith. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. We read in Philippians. How we thank you, O oh God, that you are the God who has made us and loved us and made this world and created all things. We, we look to you, gracious God and Father. We wish to rest in you. We wish to delight in you. We wish to remember who you are and what you have done. Lord, on this day, as we remember especially the death of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us on the cross once and all, and all that that means about the power of forgiveness and the hope of eternal life, we would just pause to acknowledge you as the one true God. We would pause to confess our own 
brokenness and shortcomings and sins, all of which comes down to putting ourselves before anything else. We confess that we do that, Lord. We, we regard ourselves highly. We put our own needs first. We don't follow your, your law or the way you call us to live. We don't go the extra mile when asked. We don't turn the other cheek. We don't resist anger. And we fail to love you with all our heart and mind and strength. Lord, in this moment of quiet, we just would, would take a minute to, to look at our own hearts and lives and, and to surrender them again to you. Lord, thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for this time to be called by you, to be reminded of who you are. We, we wish again to be met by you and to commune with you, the one true and living God. All these things we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is from Psalm 101. turn to God's word uh, to Romans, and I'm not actually sure if we have a reader this morning. <laughs> Someone, yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Mike's going to read for us uh, Romans chapter 12. Okay, our scripture reading this morning is from Romans 12, verses 9 to 21. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. 
On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning again. It's great to be in your midst, and I know that um, all the pastors are back in Hamilton, but your pastor is in Mercy, and I'm here uh, this morning. Some, sometime we'll get this all sorted out, um, but it's great to be able to uh, lead you uh, this morning. I'd like to open our Bibles again to Psalm 101. Psalm 101, it's a Psalm of David. If you're new to the Christian faith, David was a king uh, in the Old Testament, the king Uh, by which every other king was compared to. Uh, He was the one who killed Goliath with the Lord's strength. He ruled for 40 years. Um, He was a man who wrote many psalms in the book of Psalms in the Bible, actually. And what's also beautiful about David is that right from the get-go, he wanted to give his life to the Lord, to walk before the Lord blamelessly, or you could say with integrity. So let us open our Bibles then in relation to that to Psalm 101, and I'll read the whole psalm. Psalm 101 of David, a psalm. It says, I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what is faithless. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's ask the Lord for a blessing over his word this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for this awesome privilege of opening your word again. We get to open your word, uh, one of the primary means of grace, one of the ways that you touch our hearts by your spirit, and then we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we thank you that you're here this morning to feed our souls. And may your spirit then do an awesome work amongst us, encouraging, convicting, leading, guiding us, Father, so that more and more we may find our hope solely in Jesus Christ and live before him blamelessly. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. So I've entitled this sermon, How Then Shall I Live as a Follower of Christ? And I imagine that question um, is a question that you are struggling with uh, daily, and I hope that you do. How then should you live as a, as a Christ follower? Well, the question um, is more easily asked than maybe lived out, of course, because it's not too difficult, you understand, in the Christian faith to have the name of Jesus on your lips, but have him not in your heart. I don't know if you've read the book, Not a Fan, by Kyle Eidelman. I do highly recommend the book. It's on the screen in front of me. Kyle Eidelman has written this book a number of years ago, but he asks, is it possible, sorry, it is possible to be a fan of Christ and not a follower. It's possible to be a fan of Christ and not a follower. Let me illustrate this this fan versus follower maybe just briefly with um, a Blue Jays game, for better or for worse. So two week, or last week, Saturday, I went to a Blue Jays game as a fan. You can imagine I'm not on the team. And uh, I, 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 I was a pretty good fan, maybe on the side of fans. I was maybe on the poor side. But I did find a blue campfire shirt, which I thought was pretty apropos. And I have a blue and white, a brand new blue and white Mercy cap. And, and the blue in the Mercy cap is very close to the blue of the Blue Jay in the Blue Jays uh, logo. So I thought... I'm a good fan. I went there, uh, and I found 45 other thousand people there with me, all fans. My my boys also came with me. 
And um, they were much better fans there than I. Some people had placards. Some people even painted their faces. Some crazies even painted their, you know, parts of their body. But one thing that bound us all together at the Blue Jay game was simply this, that we were all fans. We had no skin in the game. We were not there when the coach kind of berated us for, for, a, for a bad catch or, or a miss or um, a slide that we didn't get to the second base in time and got out. And uh, we, we just weren't there. We weren't there when, when we had the, the whole crowd saying, oh, when they missed the ball. Because we had no skin in the game. We were fans. And when I went home that night, I basically f forgot the game, to be honest. I know they won. That was really cool. But that's about as far as it went. Because it's not that hard, you understand, to show up and be a fan. And really, in the Christian life, it's actually not that hard to be here this morning. You might get a little bit of pressure from your coworkers or otherwise to say, why are you, working, or why are you not working on Sunday? Or, um, you know, there's other things to do. But really, to show up here this morning is not that difficult. To even talk the talk, I've realized, as a Christian, is not that difficult. It's easy to be a fan of Christ. It's harder to be a follower. And the test comes, really, when you leave this space. When you go home, when you go to work, are you a fan of Christ there or actually a follower? Kyle Eidemann makes this point. He says, we live at a time when we have become increasingly comfortable with separating what we say we believe with how we live. We have convinced ourselves that our beliefs are sincere, even though they have no impact on how we live. That's a fan. We're not changed by the power of the gospel. You see, it's possible uh, to be a believer in Christ and, 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 and not have a spirit-filled passion to follow Christ. It's possible to say, I follow Jesus, but actually not follow him. And that's just the sad reality. And the sad reality in all of that is that those who are fans of Christ ultimately have no part with Christ. Just as I, as a fan, I had no part in the dugout. I didn't even try to get in there, of course, in the dugout of the Blue Jays. I was not on their team. But are you on Christ's team this morning? That's the question that we're going to ask ourselves this morning. Are we a fan of Christ or are we merely, or sorry, are we a fan of Christ or are we actually a follower? And if you're new to the Christian faith here this morning and wondering what this all is about, this fan and follower of Christ, well, let me just assure you that when Jesus uh, saves us from the penalty of our sin. He doesn't call us to be a fan waving a banner. I love Jesus. Well, we can wave that too. But he calls us into active relationship with him, into active pursuit of him, into following him with all our heart, soul, and mind. And I think, you know, that's what, exactly what David teaches us here in Psalm 101. He's about 30 years old. He's just beginning his ministry, ministry, his kingship. And he has these promises, he has these pledges, he has these vows that he wants to make uh, before the Lord. And I have taken from Psalm 101 five vows, five promises of one who wants to pursue the Lord, who wants to follow the Lord in his work, in his life, for the, all the days of his life. And, and here are the five, uh, and I will begin with the first one, I will delight in God's love and justice. That's the first promise that he makes to the Lord as a follower of God. Verse 1, I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praise. David's saying, I, I will worship you, Lord, for your divine attributes. I'm going to worship you for your love, and I'm going to worship you uh, for your justice. And, and if you open scripture um, and, and you begin to read from beginning to end, those two words, God's love and God's justice, continue to find themselves on the pages of scripture. But, but they're not just words beautiful attributes of God. No, these are words put to action. And what, God, what David is worshiping God for and vowing his life to is the worship of God for the acts of God, his acts of love, his acts of justice. David knew very well that his forefather Abraham was met by God. God met him and said, I'm going to be your God and the God of your descendants. 
and I'm going to bind myself to you in what we call a covenant, in a, in a binding relationship. But what bound that relationship uh, between Abraham and God and Abraham's descendants in the Lord was love, was his hesed, his loving kindness. And so throughout the journey of Israel, David, Abraham became the father of the great nation through his son Isaac, then Jacob became the father of a great nation, Israel. And through the journey of Israel, for many hundreds and even thousands of years, God was faithful to that covenant. He says, I'm going to love you with an unbounded love, with a steadfast love. Even though he had to bear their pride, their indifference, their disobedience, his loving kindness never ended. Psalm, Isaiah 54, verse 8 says these beautiful words. He says, in an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. This is, this is God speaking. But with everlasting kindness, loving kindness, I will have compassion on you. David says, I'm going to praise God for that love. But not forgetting his justice. Those two are often combined in Scripture and need to be. In justice, he punished the Egyptians for persecuting his people. In justice, he, he had the nations of the Canaan disciplined, even destroyed because of their deplorable and despicable sins against the holy God. And in his justice, he even disciplined his own people, sending them into exile, but then in his love, bringing them back into the homeland that he gave them. His love and his justice, David says, I know of those and I will sing of them. But you understand as New Testament believers, I hope you understand as New Testament believers, um, that we sing a new song. And we sing a new song of God's love and God's justice. It's very beautiful if you understand the mercy, the life of Jesus Christ, that when he came to this earth, he incarnated, you could say, those two attributes. In, in John 1 verse 14, it talks about Jesus coming in the flesh, full of grace, it says, which is another word for love, and truth, which is another word for justice. Those two attributes incarnated in Christ, you can see him live those out all the days of his life on earth. But what's even more beautiful is that these two realities, God's justice and God's love, then converge at the cross, which is what we're going to celebrate shortly this morning. If nothing else, there we meet a full demonstration of God's love and a complete and full demonstration of God's justice. In love, Christ willingly bore the penalty of our sin. The wages of sin is death, even eternal death. Jesus bore that all for us in love. And then in justice, God's justice was satisfied because he poured all of that wrath against our sins, of our sins against his only son. And in the end, love wins because Jesus rises victoriously over the grave. And then Paul picks up those themes in the book of Romans back and forth throughout the first chapters of Romans. Then he comes to Romans chapter 12, which we read. But in verse 1, he says, in view of God's mercy, because mercy triumphs over judgment. In view of God's mercy, he says, now offer yourselves as holy sacrifices, living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That's your spiritual act of worship. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we need to constantly delight in God's mercy. We need to constantly delight in his justice. We need even to sing about those, those beautiful attributes of God as a living commitment to him, as followers of Christ. That needs to shape our identity. I hope it shapes yours this morning. That's the first. Here's the second. I will walk with integrity in my home. Not only will I sing of your love and your justice, I'm going to walk with integrity in, your, in my home, uh, David says. He says this in verse 2. He says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me, he asks. I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. Now, David's commitment to living with integrity, another word for blamelessness is integrity. David's commitment to living with integrity begins, you understand, with deep reflection. The NIV, I think, has, could have translated this a bit tighter. It says, I will, I will be careful to, to, to do what you want. The ESV says, I will ponder your ways in my heart. And I, and I think that word ponder captures it a little bit better. I will deliberate, it says David, saying, I will deliberate on what it means to be holy before you. 
I'm going to think about this. And, and, and my informed passion to, to live out a holy life before you needs to be informed solely by your word. When we ponder the way of integrity, when we understand the contours of integrity, when we understand the contours of living a blameless life, we need to understand this through the context of God's holy word. So we ponder God's word and learn how to live before him. David says, I'm going to ponder that daily so that your ways are my ways, O God. Without deep reflection on God's word, it's very, very hard to walk with integrity in your home and then in the public square. We need God's word to guide us. But David realizes another thing, and he just gives us a faint picture of this reality, and we realize it all the more, that with God's, God's word without God's spirit is not going to be any benefit to us. We need God's word in our hearts, but we need God's presence with that word to live out the conviction in our hearts. We need his help. So we read in Psalm 101, I'll be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I need you. We just sang in Psalm 101, and I like this rendition of the psalm. It says, when will you come to me lest I wander? Our blamelessness is dependent on God's spirit. Without his help, we're not able to fight the battle for holiness in our lives. We ponder the truth, and we seek out his presence to live it out. That's what it means to begin to understand what a life of integrity looks like for a follower of Christ. Integrity. It's a beautiful word. As followers of Christ, we're called to walk with integrity. I hope all of you know what that means. It's not something you can buy in the marketplace. You can't go to Costco and buy integrity. I don't think they sell it there. Though they sell everything else. It takes a lifetime to build or to accrue in a moment to evaporate integrity. No one can force integrity upon you. It has to spur up from the deep recesses of your heart those decisions that you make has to come from here, and really it is a spiritual gift to be able to walk with integrity every day. But David says, I want to. I'm vowing myself to. And then he says, it's going to begin at home, not in the public square, not in the church assemblies. He says, I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. And I think the reason he starts there, because it's because of this, that is the greatest test to our integrity happens in the privacy of our homes or cars. But let's go to the home. You understand, loved ones, that the man you are at home is the man you are, full stop. You understand, women, that the woman you, woman you are at home is the woman you are, full stop. Picking on you teens for a second. The teen you are at home is the teen you are. The child you are at home is the child you are. It doesn't matter how well you perform in the public square. It doesn't matter how well you perform at school, at work, in the assembly of God's people, at church. It doesn't matter how well you perform. The person you are is the person you are at home. And maybe the Lord is speaking to you this morning. Maybe you need to address the person you are at home. I need to. Maybe there are some things you're covering up or acting like they don't really matter because they, nobody knows outside of your home. That's not integrity, loved ones. Maybe it's anger, coarse words or comments, gossip or slander, bitterness, sexual impurity, greed, gluttony, idolatry of any kind. The Lord Jesus does not want us to waste another moment with those sins. 
We, loved ones, need to conduct the affairs of our home with integrity, lest in vain we seek to serve Christ outside of our home. If we can't withstand the scrutiny of our family, we have no business conducting the affairs of the Lord in any other arena of our life. The Lord have mercy on us. As we pledge ourselves to commit to a life of integrity, beginning in the privacy of our home. That's where it begins. I will delight in God's love and justice. I will walk with integrity in my home. But David unpacks that a little bit more. He says, I will hate and flee from all that is sinful. I will hate and flee from all that is sinful. And he seems then to now narrow the field. Maybe where the temptation is the strongest, he begins to narrow the field, the the line of vision, you could say, no pun intended, on that area. And that's this, I won't look with approval on anything that is vile. I won't look with approval on anything that is vile. In Hebrew, the word is worthless. Anything that is corrupt, anything that's impure, anything that's contrary to the holiness of God, I will not let that settle into my line of vision and sit there. Because what sits there settles here. Whatever is constantly in your line of vision begins to find its home in your heart, corrupting the very nature of your soul. He said, I'm not going to have that. I read that in palaces in the ancient Near East, there were spaces that were fully devoted to the gratification of the flesh and to the lusts of the eyes. The gods of the ancient Near East were often put up on scripts and, 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 and other, they were um, sculptured or they were on the wall. There's a picture of some of these gods. A lot of these gods were cloaked with impurity and eroticism, feeding the lusts of the flesh. David say, David say in my home, In my life, that's not going in front of my eyes. Now, none of us have have rooms dedicated to the gods of the ancient Near East, unless we're archaeologists, and probably you aren't, I don't know. But we have our gods, loved ones. We have instruments connecting us to the gods of our age, probably more so than any time in the history of the world. You see, our devices can easily become living rooms of licentiousness, impurity, and sexual fantasies, of idolatry, feeding the carnal desires of lust and greed and pride. That's our God. It might just be captured in this little object right here. Which might be the greatest test to our integrity, by the way. David is making a promise, loved ones, that's timeless, regardless of the culture or culture or age or the electronic devices that we have at our disposal. He's making a covenant with God. He's saying, I will not put anything impure in front of my eyes. David, or Job, made a similar covenant. The servant God of God named Job made a similar statement. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Job 31, verse 1. What David is saying here, loved ones, is simply this. I'm going to delight in God's love and justice, and I'm going to allow my soul, loved ones, to be satisfied there. I'm going to delight in God's love and and His justice, and the ways of God are going to satisfy my soul. I'm not going to put anything in my frontal view that feeds my flesh. Those carnal desires that lead me astray down the path of sin My eyes, loved ones, in the name of Jesus, now we're going to be fixed on my Savior. That's where we need to fix our eyes. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We need to delight ourselves in Christ so much, loved ones, that he alone satisfies our deepest needs. He has to be in frontal view. Because what sits there settles here. Remember that. The simple fact is the only reason we set our eyes on other things, loved ones, to be blatantly honest, is because we're not fully satisfied in Him. I know that. And you know that. 
We need something more to feed our passions and to satisfy our lustful itches. David said, I will not look with approval on anything that is not you and not your ways. But he doesn't end there. What's interesting about David, he just keeps wanting to go deeper all the time. A lot of the authors do. He actually begins to go to the source of those picks, you could say. The source of that idolatry. Where, where is it, who's, who's marketing these sins? Because there's, a, there's, a, there's an area of marketing of sin where there's, there's, a, there's an exchange of goods and services and all that. People who are engaged in those who activity, those who set snares for others to join them in this pattern of sin, to replace God by the things of this world, by the carnal desires of the flesh, just, just this, this, this replacement. He calls it out in verse 3. He says, I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it, in what they do. Well, the faithless that he's talking about in the land are actually people who did... Um, understand and do know who God is, but they have apostatized. They have fallen away from the truth. These are people who are particularly insidious because they are more able to rationalize evil now that they have given up on God. They're no longer delighting in God's love and justice, and no, there's nothing in them that wants to pursue holiness. Holiness. They have let go of the moorings of their past instruction. They are set adrift on the sea of licentiousness and impurity and perversity. They proliferate sin. They don't care what God says. And, and, and David says, I, I don't want anything to do with what they do. They're marketing in sin. Their hearts are perverse, he goes on. They slander their neighbor. Their eyes are proud. They practice deceit. I hate what they do but I'm going to follow my God whatever the cost. It's very interesting that David almost captures the same kind of parallel in Romans 12. I'm not sure if you caught that. But he begins by saying love must be sincere, and then he continues, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. He goes on, be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. Do not be conceited. Do not be proud. In other verses, he talks about fleeing sexual immorality. Don't let even a hint of that live in your life. But he's, what he's saying is that for you to live a life of integrity, you need to separate yourself from that, and you need to, again, fix your li- eyes on Christ because your integrity is dependent upon him alone. That's what it means to be a follower, but here it goes. Here's number four connected to that. He says, I will surround myself with those who are godly. If I'm not going to associate with those who are doing those wicked things and not supporting their industry, I, I, I need to surround myself with people who are godly. It's true, you do. Verse 6, my eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. Those, who walk, those whose walk is blameless will minister to me. He said, my eyes are going to be set on the faithful. Even if there's not that many of them, I'm going to set my eyes on the faithful in the land. Those who share the same faith, those who have the same passion for holiness, those who want to esteem God for all he is, those who want to celebrate his love and his justice, those are the people I'm going to surround myself with. For us, those who love Jesus, those are the people I'm going to surround myself with. Because, as it's been said, you show me your friends, and I will show you your future. It's been said, you show me your friends, and I will show you who you are. It's been said, you are the average of the five to ten people you surround yourself with. You're just the average of those people you spend time with every day of the week, those you call friends. I've seen Christians drift from the church and from the fellowship of the saints and from the communion of saints, and you can ask them, how are you spending your time? Actually, you can ask them more pointedly, who are you spending your time with? They say, well, I have my church family. I say, yes. But what about the rest of the week? They spend their majority of their time with non-Christian school friends or non-Christian workmates. Some of them, you know, you have to work with. I get that. 
But these people who they're spending their time with have no desire for the holiness of Jesus, no desire to share in the love of Christ, no desire for his glory. And you become that average of those who have no passion for the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot expect to be a passionate follower of Jesus with a vibrant faith when you constantly live with those who are undermining him in all of their actions. You become their average. David, as I said earlier, was a 30-year-old man when he wrote this, and his passion at a very young age, he realized this, and I hope you young people realize this all the same, that you need to be surrounded by people who are full of faith who love Jesus, who are passionate about his holiness. Do you have those in your life? Growing up, I attended a, uh, a public high school up way up north, north of the 401. And I was beginning to really drift by about grade 11. Like, I went to a Christian elementary school, but by grade 11, I was really drifting from all that belonged to God, it seemed. I was listening to scores and scores of secular music. I was hanging with friends who didn't really care anything about Jesus. And I was becoming like the music I was listening to and the friends I was hanging with. Somehow those two are very connected. Then in grade 11, God sent me a friend from Mississauga. He didn't we, didn't, we weren't friends before he came from Mississauga. He just came, and we became friends. And at the end of grade 11, my friend came to school one day. This is a long time ago, just saying. And he had destroyed most of his secular music, most of it. And the way he destroyed it was, I don't know if you know these things, but there was a day when we listened to cassette tapes. And I was just talking to someone, and when I preached this in another church, they said, you remember those days when you find a cassette tape on the road, side of the road, and the tape was like going for like a mile behind it, and then you're trying to roll up the tape inside the cassette so you could listen to it, and it sounded like really crazy. And most of you are like, what was that day? Yeah, it actually existed. <laughs> he took those tapes and he cracked them all. Most of them. Not all secular music is wrong. But most of it was. Because he said this, it's not helping me in my walk with the Lord Jesus. Grade 11. He probably had the singular, highest singular influence on my life in my high school years, probably into my university years. He's still a good friend of mine. He's a pastor. We meet every three or four weeks for prayer together. He challenged me that day, and then he introduced me to Petra. Don't know if you know that band either. This is what the communion of saints is meant to do, loved ones, to draw us closer to Jesus, sometimes by making very difficult decisions for him. He had a lot of tapes. It would have cost him hundreds and hundreds of dollars. In today's value, probably thousands. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Get people around you who build you up, and you can build them up to become more like Christ. Because one of the hardest things to do with your friends who are drifting from Jesus is to stand in the gap and say, stop. And they're going to say, you're not cool, man. When you do that. It's hard to, stand, to stem that tide of indifference towards Jesus Christ in your friend group. So pick your friends carefully. Now this is mostly to our younger members, but maybe our older members need to hear this as well. Sometimes you just need to stand up and be counted, loved ones. Be counted and numbered among the faithful. Don't be ashamed. Don't hang with those who are deceptive, who are disobedient to their parents, who are full of pride, who delight in sin, who market sin, who don't care about the things of God, who do not love Jesus and the gospel, who are not kind to the hurting and to the broken. Leave them, love them, leave them, and leave them with a prayer that they will change or there is no friendship. I like what C.S. Lewis says about this, and I'm going to then move on to my fifth point. He says, but I'm inclined to think a Christian would be wise to avoid where he decently can any meeting with people who are bullies, lust-filled, cruel, dishonest, spiteful, and so forth. He says, not because we're too good for them, 
In a sense, we're not good enough. We're not good enough to cope with all the temptations, nor clever enough to cope with all the problems, which an evening spent in such society produces. We're not able to stand, to withstand. So surround yourself with godly friends. Here's the last point. I will not be silent in the face of evil. Verse 8, every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. We don't have that same authority. We do not have the same power as King David to, to cut off the evildoer from the land. Uh, he governed through a theology, uh, but we don't have that position. But this does not exempt us from active engagement, loved ones. We know the quote, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, and you can add women, to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for us to do nothing. But Christ in his rule of this world has made the church, you understand, the conscience of the nation. That's us. We are the conscience of this nation. The church, that is her members, need to be the voice of truth. We need to begin by just showing love and compassion to the hurting, to the broken, to the marginalized. We need to be there. We need to walk with integrity in our home and honesty in our home and then translate that into the marketplace so that with honesty and integrity, we live out our daily life at the workplace, at school, in the church, whatever we're doing. And then we need to take that heart of love for God's love and justice and that integrity and by God's grace speak into our neighbors' lives, the lives of those around us with love and integrity and truth. And then we need to write to our political leaders. We need to defend the rights of the unborn. We need to advocate for the marginalized. We need to live our faith out in the world so that Jesus will be made known and evil will be silenced. That's our call. Let me close with this. David made these beautiful vows probably when he was young in his ministry or his kingship. It was like a ministry. You could argue that David was tested against every single one of those vows. His aim was to walk not as a fan, but as a follower. But he fell. Sometimes he fell bad. Never beyond the grip of grace. And if you have fallen badly this morning, if you look at your life in the past and you have fallen against any one of these vows, if you're here this morning, you're not beyond the grip of grace. But if you were to meet with King David somehow, or if King David could live out the experiences of his life again, I think he would say some things to you. He would have said, I, you know, I, I, I vowed to delight in God's love and justice, but I wish I did that more, and I wish I nurtured my children in, the, in God's love and in God's justice, in his grace and in his truth, because David had a very dysfunctional family. I wish I walked with integrity that evening. I saw my neighbor's wife bathe right in front of my eyes. I wish I had a support group, the godly in the land, who could stand up against me when those fires of lust and power burn within my soul and say, David, stop, what are you doing? I wish they were there that night before I committed adultery and then executed her husband. But David, you understand, is not our redeemer. Jesus is a son of David. He's our redeemer. He sets the bar for what it means to follow our Lord. He did it so beautifully. He delighted in God's salvation plan. We read in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. For the joy, he delighted in God's salvation plan. Jesus walked with integrity. And all God's people say, Amen. He did. You cannot find anything that would besmirch his character on the pages of Scripture. You can't. In his private life and in his public life, our Savior walked with absolute blamelessness, with integrity. He hated sin. He hated the patterns of sin. He hated the power of sin. 
He surrounded himself, he tried to at least, with the faithful, but the faithful kept standing against him. And one of the faithful, he said, get behind me, Satan, because you do not have God's will in mind here. That was Peter. But never in, in, in all of that did he compromise his faith and his purpose, even a little bit. It was that integrity, that blamelessness that Jesus led, that led Jesus to the hill of Calvary, which we're going to celebrate momentarily, to take on our shame, to bear the, bear the sin of our broken promises, our failed attempts, our wandering spirits. He, he, spirits, he, he bore it all. The corruption that has plagued us by the things that we have seen, that have settled into our hearts, that corrupted spirit, he has borne the shame of that and the guilt of that, and he has come to cleanse your spirit. He has forgiven you, loved ones. As you receive him by faith this morning, you are forgiven and you are redeemed. But remember this that you are redeemed for a purpose. Not to return to patterns of unholiness, not to have the chains of impurity laid in on your heart and on your conscience with guilt again. No, he, you're, you're called to let that go. You're called to live a life fully devoted to him as his follower, not a fan. Jesus doesn't need any fans, by the way. One day every knee will bow in heaven and earth and every tongue confess that he is Lord. He doesn't need fans. What he delights to see in his church, his followers, passionate followers, followers who fulfill their promises by the power of the Holy Spirit to live lives of integrity devoted to him. So I leave you with this question this morning, loved ones. Are you a fan or are you prepared to be a follower? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace that you show us. We thank you so much for Jesus, the man of integrity par excellence, the one who walked a blameless life in our place. We thank you that he, by his grace, has forgiven us because we have broken our promises to you, and we are sorry. But you call us to a living hope, a, a new reality, a cleansed spirit. You call us to live out in full devotion to you in a pursuit of holiness in every area of our life. And so, Father, disclose to us any area of our life where we're compromising the truth, where we're living in corruption, in unholiness. Expose it. Bring us to our knees. Do whatever it takes. Cause us to suffer so that we repent and turn to you and find our joy and our satisfaction in Christ alone. We pray this by the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us rise in response. Let us sing, yet not I, but through Christ, but through Christ in me.
the reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Hear these words. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, just a few words about what we're doing around this table as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. A few things to consider. It's it's not a... A superstition, it's, uh, it's not a magic trick, it's, it's not something we just do by road over and over and over. There is meant to be a time of deep meaning and communion with the living Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we come to this table, let us remember a couple things as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive of the grace of Jesus Christ for our lives I hope that as we come to this table, we will take a moment to remember and to trust that God the Father has sent Jesus Christ, his Son, to earth according to all of his promises. Remember that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, assumed human flesh and blood and all that that meant. He became incarnate. He became one of us with all of our brokenness and frailty and sufferings. Remember that Jesus came and, uh, with a purpose, following the will of his Father, and bore in his body on the cross our sins so that we might know freedom and forgiveness. He suffered. He died. He was innocent yet condemned that we might be acquitted before God. Jesus was nailed to a cross. He humbled himself. He could have called the angels from heaven to take him out of that time of suffering and death, but he humbled himself to his Father's will and to death on a cross for us that while he's forsaken, we might be forgiven. Jesus said on the cross, it's finished. And for us, all the work that we need to be made acceptable, to have a joyous relationship With God our Father, all of that is finished. The joy of eternal life. Second, just as we come to this table, I would invite you to consider the food that we're offered here, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, uh, made real to us by the Holy Spirit. Um, Consider this food as compared to the food that we have available to us in the world around us. Now, There's amazing food in the world around us, isn't there? Uh, Maybe you think of a delicious, I don't know, pizza or a a T-bone steak or if you're a vegetarian, just a delicious red pepper. I don't know. (laughs) If that's delicious on its own, maybe it is. But can you just think about for a minute as we come here that this is meant to, we're meant to know that, that this supersedes any nourishment that we can find in this world. This is... This is heavenly nourishment. This is spiritual nourishment. We're not just physical people. God created us as spiritual beings as well. And our souls as people are hungry. Our souls need feeding. All of us, all that we are needs feeding. We're hungry on the food that we can seek and find around us from our own resources. And God knows this and sent his son Jesus Christ Uh, to give his body and blood for us, that we might commune with him, that our souls may be filled. As Pastor Ian was saying, our souls might be transformed, cleansed. As we read in Psalm 81, God uh, promises to satisfy us with the finest of wheat. Also, remember that, as I read earlier, we're coming to this table not as individuals, but as part of the body of Christ united through the death and resurrection of Jesus, one body. And finally, we remember that 
this table and the work that Christ has done uh, points us forward, is meant to give us hope. It's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. It's a foretaste of the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's meant to give us hope in a world that's evil, isn't it? In a world where we, we see evil sometimes being too strong. <laughs> this table means it's not, it's not the end. God's work is not finished. Christ will return. There is the final marriage feast of the Lamb that we read about in Revelation. Christ will return. A new creation, sin and evil, will be defeated finally, once and for all. And one of the great marks of that final feast in the book of Revelation is rejoicing. Rejoicing in the presence of God. Hallelujah, it says, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice. So come, among other things, with hunger, <laughs> with need, but come also with joy. As you come to the table, we're invited not to focus solely on the outward elements of bread and wine, but remember especially Christ's love for Remember that Christ died for you. Remember that you are remembered by God the Father through Jesus Christ in heaven. Jesus advocates to the Father on our behalf and that nothing can separate us from his love. Come and be nourished with this bread, Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Come and be filled and satisfied with this wine, the blood of Jesus Christ poured out, shed, sacrificially for you. Everyone who, as an invitation, let me just offer this invitation again. Everyone who loves Jesus Christ today, everyone who looks to Jesus Christ alone for their salvation is welcome to come to this table. If you are sincerely sorry for your sins, if you follow Jesus Christ with a heart of repentance and contrition, if you follow Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're now invited to come with gladness and to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe you're not in that place today. Maybe you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you have not yet called yourself a Christian in front of others or in the community of a church. We're so glad you're here. It's wonderful you're here to learn and grow, but we'd ask you to abstain from eating the bread and wine today and maybe consider instead for a while what Christ has done and the claims that he has made and what that means for your life and for the world. Can we pray together? Let us pray. Gracious Father, how we thank you for all that you've done. We're a people and people who have wandered from you. Indeed, we're lost. Yet you've sent your Son, Jesus Christ, in mercy and in grace, full of grace and truth, to bring us back to you, to die for us, to sacrifice his life for us, that we might be completely forgiven. So, Lord, will you send your Holy Spirit now, especially in this time of sacrament, that our hearts might come to trust anew and afresh Jesus Christ. That our souls, as sometimes empty and bruised up as they are, might be healed and touched. That we indeed, through this bread and wine and by the power of your Holy Spirit, may commune with you, the living God. Lord, all these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who teaches us to pray, together saying, in the words of the Lord's Prayer, we pray together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory.
forever. Amen. Friends, the bread we break is the communion in the body of Christ. And the wine we drink is communion, the blood of Christ. I invite you to, as the office bearers come forward, just to hold your bread and wine if you're partaking today until the end, and we'll all uh, eat and drink together. I invite the office bearers. Remember and believe that the body of Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And take, drink, remember and believe that the blood of Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless 
his holy name. Amen. We'll bow down for a moment and pray for the congregation and for the city. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Father, how we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We thank you for the elements of bread and wine. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to touch and hold these. And we thank you that the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives draws us closer and assures us of Christ's promises, lifts us up, unites us with him. And as we gather around in worship, remembering the broken body of Jesus, we cannot help but remember, Lord, a broken and needy world, one for which Christ died. We come, Lord, thanking you for our city, the city of Hamilton. We rejoice in this city and thank you for its people. How we ask for your blessing upon this city and that the name of Jesus would be heard and spread and spoken. That the gospel might be sent out from churches around this city and region and that many might come to live under the love the banner of Christ. We pray for, as the summer ends, for what's happening in the city with summer camps coming to a close, with students arriving and leaving the city, a time of transition. We ask your blessing upon all those going through those changes. We pray also for our own congregation here, blessings. We thank you for your work and presence here. Remember, Luke and Carolyn, who are married this weekend, we ask that you'd bless them especially, watch over them, guide them, unite them in their new life together. May they be good news indeed for each other. Just support them and surround them and watch over them in every way we pray. We pray for small groups here at Blessings as they ramp up for the fall and for big in the youth program we ask your blessing as that begins soon be with every leader investing in that ministry lord in this year ahead we pray and as we leave from here we ask your your special blessing on the people on the lock street festival even though the street is closed and we pray that that each person on that street today might have a special sense of your love grace and the meaning that Jesus brings, and may others, as we go from here, Lord, see Christ in us, use us in gentle and whatever ways you wish to be his hands and feet in this world. And so we offer you our lives once more. Through Christ we pray. Amen. as we uh, bring the service to a close as an opportunity to respond with uh, an offering and there's information about the offering uh, on the screens behind me Uh, this at this moment the deacons are collecting for needs outside the church uh, and uh, and and, and to do that especially uh, this month we're looking at the Wycliffe Bible translators what a wonderful ministry this is if you aren't familiar with Wycliffe Bible translators I encourage you to look this up Uh, you'll discover uh, on some of the literature they provide that there are over 7,000 languages in the world and there's only a full Bible uh, translated in 700 of those languages. So only 10% of all the languages in the world have a full Bible. Um, And their mission is really to, um, uh, is a world where the scriptures lead to transformed lives. So you're welcome to give to this ministry, deacons at blessingshamilton.ca. If this is your first or second time, or you're a newcomer to Blessings, you're not expected to do that, uh, we're just glad that uh, you're here this morning. I invite you, uh, as you're able, to uh, rise now for the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.
for joining us. Have a great morning and a great week.